The next speaker and the first speaker of the session three is uh, Stephen Drew from Innocente, United Kingdom. Uh, it is difficult to introduce him because his bio is almost, uh, say, described uh, Innocentive. <laughs> but uh, I think uh, uh, he is working for, uh, say, uh, uh, for Inno Innocentive for three years as a vice president of business development in Europe. And he has a long experience in the innovation area, such as program solving and content and research software solutions. So let us listen to his talk, The Role of Crowdsourcing in Risk Assessment. Stephen. Thank you very much. Um, so yes, my name's Stephen Drew. Um, just to make it very clear, Innocentive is a US company based just outside of Boston. Um, I, I come from the UK. Um, Innocentive actually started, it was very much the pioneer of using crowdsourcing um, as a way of finding solutions to scientific and technology problems. This started all the way back in 1999. So this isn't new. It's been going for many years. It's been used thousands and thousands of times. Um, now, I, I've actually changed the title of my talk here. It was the role of crowdsourcing. I just put an extra word in there, potential role of crowdsourcing. You know, so, that, so the role here is to think about how might this be used against some of the challenges that you're facing. Okay, so the first thing to say, of course, is the world is getting more and more connected. We all take part in that. In fact, today, it's more connected than it was yesterday. Tomorrow, it will be more connected than it was today. So crowdsourcing is taking advantage of that dynamic that affects all of us, but allows all of us to contribute. There's a move towards crowd labor. In life, we're moving more and more to crowd labor. It's affecting our personal lives. It's affecting our business lives. Just think about it. The biggest taxi company in the world today is Uber. It's not always the most popular company with some authorities, but it's the biggest taxi company in the world, and yet it owns no taxis. The people who run those are just people in the crowd. Uber is a facilitator. Think about Airbnb. Airbnb is pretty much now the biggest hotel or the biggest accommodation provider in the world. And yet it owns no accommodation. The people are just people in the crowd who give up their facilities for people to use. Airbnb is a facilitator. Increasingly, everything that we do in our day-to-day -day lives, there will be different options of provision, and crowdsourcing is one of those. Um, we like to think that Innocentive is one of the providers for the crowd for problem solving for scientific and technology problems. Anyone in the crowd can take part, anyone. So, the world is becoming hyper-connected. Let's take advantage of those hyper-connections. So, if we look at a more conventional world around innovation, companies have their own resources, they have specific structures, people, fixed costs. Sometimes there's more diversity required. Sometimes there's more adaptation required. Let's look at open innovation. Let's look at crowdsourcing, what we call challenge-driven innovation, where we let the problem engage people around the world who want to take part and contribute to the resolution of that problem. Um, so we focus on the challenge. We focus on presenting the challenge so people want to take part. They want to make their contribution. It can be applied to so many different things. Um, and there's some really big advantages. On-demand talent right across the world at a moment's notice. Compression, hundreds of eyes looking at a problem 
at the same time, but in their own different ways. And I've just mentioned speed. So a challenge, this is what we use to present uh, our clients' problems to the world. Um, it's an open innovation tool. We talk about people seeking solutions, and we talk about the solvers who provide the answers, or could provide the best answers. Seekers and solvers. We can pretty much ask for anything. We can ask for ideas, or we can ask for very specific solutions for, to very difficult problems. Why do all these people take part? There's an award. They get cash. They get money. Dollars talk right across the world. So we put a challenge out there. We put money against the problem. People can see what their risk is. They can decide if they want to take part. And if they're successful, they can win an award for coming up with the best solution or the solution that meets the requirement. Um, and yes, there's things to do with intellectual property and confidentiality and sensitivity, but all these things have been thought about. This process has been run hundreds of times. There's pre-agreements to help overcome those problems. So the power of challenges, solving problems, but also creating awareness. Increasingly, we see companies will present their challenges and they're very comfortable that everyone knows that it's their problems that they're trying to deal with and promoting the fact that they're trying to deal with these problems. So sometimes they can be very anonymous, sometimes they can be very highly promoted. Okay, so, I, um, so in Ascentive, that, that network of solvers out there, literally hundreds of thousands of people that we can take advantage of. It's growing at a rate of two to 3,000 people every single month. Those people, they're all across the world. They're just people, they're just individuals. Yes, some of them represent small academic teams. Some of them represent small companies. They've got their own contacts, they've got their own networks. But we can take advantage of this to give us different, more diverse, alternative approaches to some of the problems that arise. Thousands of challenges have been run, and, and I mentioned a moment ago, many of those are anonymous. A lot of the time, there's um, confidential reasons why companies would not want to disclose themselves as having the problem. So these things can be run anonymously. Um, you can ask for IP, you can ask for ideas, you can ask for IP licenses. Really, we can take a challenge pretty much any direction we might want to take it. Okay, these people, who are they? What do they do? Well, any of you in this room potentially could be solvers. Go to the site and sign up if you're interested in taking part in problem solving. Um, they, they're spread across the world. Um, you can see across America. This is Asia Pacific. This is Europe and the Middle East. South America It's growing particularly fast in Asia Pacific and in South America as those communities advance. Um, what skills do they have? Well, like everyone, we change indus industries, we change jobs, we change disciplines, we build up new know-how as we take our path. And that's what the solvers look like. We've got chemistry, we've got physical sciences, life sciences, engineering, the mathematics, the statistics, a bit of business in there as well. Just, you know, it's a diverse community. People are diverse. We can take advantage of what they can offer. Um, and education is quite interest, you know, interesting. The, the biggest prerequisite is that you like solving problems. You're prepared to solve problems. It just so happens that most solvers do have pretty good academic qualifications. We see 65% with PhDs and with masters. But just because you have those qualifications doesn't mean you're the best problem solver. We heard earlier about how asbestos problems were noticed by the social workers, not by the scientists. And that's, that's, of course, the point here. And what do they do? Well, lots of things. Lots of diversity, so we can take advantage. Many come from academic institutions, but they really span all the different industries. And so you can think of this um, force of labor that you can bring into play um, to help address some of the challenges. Okay, and, and in fact, we can extend this. We can extend the reach into people like Nature, into people like Scientific American. This brings literally millions of potential solvers into the mix when it comes to helping with problem solving.
Okay, now, of course, if we're trying to solve a problem, the most important thing is the problem statement. Um, it's very important to spend a lot of time in the challenge formulation, as we all know. Uh, and so we do a lot of work with our clients in this area of getting the challenge correctly formulated so that we can engage the crowd but still provide a solution to the problem. So we have to think about the transition from the problem space to the solution space. So, uh, in a slight little step change here, let's look at the problem space, and I'm going to set you an exercise. Everybody in the room, I'm gonna set you a quick little exercise, and I'd love you all to take part. We've got a problem, it's the candle problem. Has anyone heard of the candle problem? Please, quick show of hands. This is, all right, don't answer. <laughs> all right, so the problem is we've got some items and we need to attach the candle to the wall using those items. These are the items. I'll give you a couple of seconds. Has anyone got the solution? Hands up those who, who think they have a solution. Okay, I'm gonna present the problem slightly differently. Has anyone got the solution? Okay, yes? <laughs> okay, here is the solution. Okay, you use the, the, you use the tacks or the drawing pins and you put them against the box and put the candle in the box. The whole point here was by differently presenting the problem, we make the solution much easier to get to. Um, and so the importance of writing the problem has such an impact upon what happens. Okay, um, let's move on. So I just want to give you a couple of examples of the use of crowdsourcing. Um, the first thing to say is we can use crowdsourcing and challenges for so many different things. And this really is just helping to represent in your minds the sort of areas to which it could be put. Um, just out of interest here, if you look at these numbers, active solvers, this is how many people are registering for each and every challenge. It's literally hundreds of people register to help solve every single challenge. That audience from the crowd, they just come to the challenges, they come to the problems, they want to take part, they're very interested in taking part. Um, so, a couple of examples here. Let's turn to NASA for the first example. NASA has got 20, 30,000 scientists and engineers. Um, interestingly, if they're working in space, if an astronaut's working in space, or if they have infrastructure in space, they need to be able to predict when there are going to be solar particle events. NASA have made a job of trying to predict this. But their prediction gave them a four-hour prediction window, and they were only 50% confident of that prediction. All right, so it's like flicking a coin when you're about to go outside and work in space. So they run a challenge, um, and the challenge was to improve upon that. Um, I'm pleased to say that the winning solver for, for a $30,000 award increased the um, the prediction window to eight hours, but importantly, the accuracy up to something like 85%. Now, the interesting thing, this winning solver, a retired radio engineer, okay? NASA continues to work with that retired radio engineer on many projects. There's the solution. It's interesting. 600 people took part. Tricky challenge. Only 11 proposals but two or three of those proposals were of very high quality. Another example, is anyone going to the Olympics next year? Anyone going to the Olympics? Okay, well, it's interesting. Perhaps that's a good idea. We see that um, announced just in April, there's these fears about um, an epidemic of the chikungunya virus. This was April this year. Interestingly, all the way back in August, 
The US um, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Agency, were also concerned about this and wanted to predict these outcomes better. So they ran a challenge all the way back in August last year. This was the challenge which we ran for them. Um, the challenge, it was a complicated challenge. There was a lot of uh, data, there were models required. There was actually a huge award, 150,000, 100,000. They were looking for solutions, data, robustness, applicability, presentation. So in, in May this year, just a few months ago, the outcome was announced. And this is the outcome, interesting. Um, we're on the cusp of enabling a revolutionary improvement in disease forecasting. And the interesting thing here, the people, not only specialists in public health and infectious diseases, experts in mathematics, ecology, computer science. So again, it's just proving the power of the crowd to bring different people into the market for problem solving. I'm, in the interest of time, I'm just going to run across this one and say thank you very much. I hope you found that uh, of, of interest. I hope you appreciated the examples. I'm sure we've got time later in the panel to take those questions further. Thank you. <laughs> That's the alarm to say I've got to finish. You, you finished just in time. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, because of, of the time is limited, uh, I think I like to take a quick question just for clarification this time. Yes, please. Uh, these competitions not just for money but also for uh, competi the competition itself. We do so for education or for I'm sorry, the mic's cutting in and out, so I can't. Um, oh, I, sorry. I can't, yeah, it's not your, I would just uh, like just to mention that w uh, competitions run by people over the world is do are done also for uh, just for uh, com the competition itself, not just for money. Yes, and, and, and look, you know, when I talk about money, m money is one um, incentive for taking part in a competition, but also grants and subsequent collaboration. Um, it's just interesting, though, how easily um, a financial figure talks to people wanting to participate. It's just a very easy thing to, for people to relate to in terms of their participation. I think we have to move on. Thank you. Thank you very much.